Um, welcome today to whatever our session's called, I can't remember, overview of the new SaltStack Enterprise. My name is Matt Maservi, I'm the Director of Product Management for SaltStack, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying I'm probably the dumbest guy at the company. So um, just a bit of background. Before we get going, let me ask you guys a question. Um, as I went through this, I prepared a kind of a, you know, long slide deck to try to explain the enterprise and explain kind of where we're going. But as I went through that, I realized maybe that's not the best way to do this. So does anybody here remember the Choose Your Own Adventure books when we were kids? Anybody remember those? A couple of you? Okay, I can tell how old you guys are. Okay. We'll have an old guy meeting after the, after the session we're here. So I'm going to give you guys a choice. Two options. Option one, we can go through the deck. We can go through sort of the kind of the corporate presentation. I can explain it. Option two, we can not go through the deck, and we can just have a conversation amongst friends. I'm going to warn you, and I normally don't like to make excuses for this, but uh, about four days ago, I woke up with this super sharp pain in my back. And I thought I'd been stabbed. As it turns out, I've joined the Kidney Stone Club. Right? And so, why do you guys care? I'm supposed to be in the hospital right now, but instead they just gave me morphine. So, got a morphine in me. I'm going to get a little relaxed. If I wander off, if we go into the HR free zone, if anybody's easily offended, maybe now's your time to leave. Um, so those are the two options. Option one is the corporate kind of clean. Option two is we'll just stop with the slides and we'll just have a conversation amongst friends. Option one, hands. That's what I thought. Okay. All right. We'll just say option two carries it then. A little bit of background. Like I said, I'm the product manager. This is not my first career. This is a second career for me. Um, I started on the world of athletics. I was on the swim team. Actually, no, I wasn't on the swim team. I was a football player. Why does that matter to you? I got out of the world of athletics, got a bad injury, and uh, when you get an injury, sometimes they give you job retraining, and then the government in their infinite wisdom decided a guy with a bad head injury should go learn about computers. So a guy with bad concussions, seizures, blackouts, they put me in computer training. So I went through the you know, requisite, the MCSE, and I got a Cisco certification. I was SUN certified. Don't bring that up again. I've tried to repress that. It's one of the few things I try to forget about over time. And I moved into, I moved into the world of IT, which was kind of entertaining. Um, the first time I went into the first job I had, they said, this is Matt. He used to be a professional football player. And people look at it because you're a professional football player. Great. This, this is the computer. This is the keyboard. And everybody kind of tried to explain that to me. Um, I went from there. I went into a company called Vinca which was a high availability mirroring company. We were then bought by Legato and then EMC. Long story short, I wound up as a data center administrator, um, then moved into consulting, and then product management. Why does that matter? It's the only way I can get credibility with a crowd like this, okay? I'm a wannabe nerd. I'm not a true nerd. I just like to hang around with you guys. Um, the only reason I came here is when I was on the football team, I showed a little bit of aptitude for the tech world. And by aptitude, I meant I was the only guy that could figure out how to log in. That's aptitude in a football team. But the takeaway here is I have a lot of experience in the data center. I understand the nights. I understand the weekends. I understand long, cold hours at a keyboard in a cool data center. I understand decreasing budgets. I understand increasing workload. I understand the fact that your bosses look at you and resent every dollar they spend on you. I, re I understand that they look at you and they try to figure out ways they can do without you. And I understand the fact that every year they ask you to do more with less. Okay, That's the takeaway here. Um, I have with me today my team. This is Shwetab, uh, Sean, Adi, and I'm not going to try his last name. I think it's Cole Carney. Back here I have Ganesh. Ganesh, I'm not going to try your last name. Diwali, right? Close enough? He's going to correct me later. I still haven't learned to pronounce that name. Today we're going to the, the, um, today we're gonna talk about the Enterprise Console. We're excited to do this for a couple reasons. You heard Tom in his opening keynote talk about the fact that SaltStack, as a, as a project, has developed an award-winning, fantastic open source tool set. As we've, as we've matured as a company, we've constantly been asked for a couple of things. Increased functionality, okay? Everybody likes the speed, the flexibility. But we have, we have, we have a, a subset of customers, and it's, it's actually more than we realized, that have said, look, I love the tool set, but we have other people that I work with or myself, I love the command line, I love the power, I love the flexibility, but I have a management team, or I have other people that I work with who don't have time 
for the command line who they need these reports, they need this history, they need this ongoing, they need this ongoing visibility into the infrastructure. So um, that's why we have Salt Stack Enterprise. Today, Salt Stack Enterprise is today Salt Stack Enterprise is uh, sort of similar to the command line version. This release will introduce a GUI for the first time. The GUI will give you graphical access into the Salt Stack infrastructure and uh, a way to see and track history of everything that's happening in your environment. Uh, before we look at it, and the primary purpose of this today is just to kind of take a look at it, and I need to, I need to let you know a couple of things. Um, the first thing I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask that uh, there's no photography allowed. Why? I don't care if you see the GUI. But there's a lot of people in this room who would not be caught dead at a graphical or a GUI presentation. I don't, I don't want any tweets going out to coworkers with them sitting in a graphical, uh, a, a GUI presentation, and, and I understand that. Uh, the first week I was at SaltStack, I was in training, and uh, there's about 12 guys there. Really interesting story. And one of the breaks, I said, hey, we're gonna release a graphical interface for this, you know, and who's gonna use that? And there's 12 guys, and one guy went like this, and then he pulled his hand down when he realized nobody else was sticking their hands in. And I said, okay, nobody's gonna use this, I get that. Everybody, everybody has their cred, right? Like, I won't even install a GUI. I won't even let my wife install a GUI. We live at the command line. I taught my two-year-old command line. He's a shell scripter. So later on break, I said, okay, well, not on break, I said, okay, who's got other coworkers who really want a GUI? 12 out of 12, yeah. This guy down the street, he, you know, guy down the cube farm, guy can't work at command line, saves life. And then one by one, individually, each of them came up to me sometimes during breaks, like, yeah, I'm, I'm totally not interested in the GUI, but I know a guy, and this guy, let's call him Steve, Sometimes he doesn't have time to go into the command line. Sometimes he doesn't have time to write scripts. He's really interested in the GUI. So can I take a look at the GUI and I'll tell him all about it. So the fact is, even though the power of the command line is important and it's, 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 it's part of our DNA, that's never gonna go away. The fact is, is that the GUI offers another layer of functional, functionality, control, and visibility. Go ahead and move this up. I'm gonna have him move the slides just because we made them. Don't look at them, they don't mean anything. Um, go ahead and go one more. The next thing I want to get from you guys is, you guys have effectively been link baited into this class. You can read this disclaimer. Basically, it says anything we say here today will probably change. <laughs> That's what that says. That's a standard product management trick. It means when you come back in like a month and say, you promised me feature, I can send you this disclaimer. The second thing is you guys have effectively been link baited into this class, okay? You thought you were coming here to get information on the GUI and that's really not why you're here. That's not the important part about this. The important part about this is what you guys can tell me. So before we get into this, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. I have a lot of experience in the data center. Um, I've managed huge server installations. Um, I actually was the product manager for Deployment Solution, which at the time was the largest deployment and management technology on the planet, both in revenue and install base. Um, we actually managed the Microsoft data centers, which was, a, which was an interesting trick since Microsoft owned SCCM and every year they would come in and pitch that product to the people who ran Microsoft.com and WindowsLive.com, and every year they failed. We did deployments. We did 20,000 deployments a month with Microsoft. As much as I know about the data center, I only know 1% of what you guys are trying to do. You guys have a much better finger on what's happening in DevOps, IT ops, and Cloud ops. And this product, Enterprise and the Enterprise Graphical Interface, if this fails, which it won't, and we'll, you'll see why in a second. I'm super excited about it. I try not to get all, I try not to get all you know, proud and geeked out about it. If the product doesn't have the features that it needs, it's on you guys. My job as a product manager is to be your representative to development and to the people who build the product. You speak to them through me. And my job is to go to them and argue for features that make sense to you and against features that maybe, one of the cool things about one of the cool things about working with developers is, I go to a developer and I say, hey, I really need this feature. And a lot of times the developers don't get it because it's, maybe it's not sexy, it's just a basic feature. Developers like to deliver what we call spinning weasels, okay? You'll recognize this. It's a feature that no customer has ever asked for, no customer would ever pay for, but it is cool as hell. I mean, it's just, it's so cool. And they're just like, you gotta see this. This is the coolest thing. These icons slide down here and then they blow up and then they slide across and, you get, and you're like, you go to customers, like, anybody who's gonna pay for this? They're like, no, it doesn't matter. I just, I just need a, a gauge with a report that tells me how much money I'm saving. And 
it's my job to make sure that we deliver you features you want and not spinning weasels, stuff that's really cool but ultimately useless. The cool thing is if we can develop really cool features, which makes your guys' job easier. So I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. First of all, go ahead and if you would consider yourself a developer or in the DevOps world, including anywhere on the spectrum, from straight dev to straight operations, stick your hand up. Who's DevOps in here? Okay. Who would be infrastructure ops? Who's managing infrastructure? So traditional IT infrastructure, okay? Okay, the difference for point of discussion is that the DevOps teams tend to manage infrastructure for the sake of deploying, testing, creating, testing, and deploying applications. They sort of, they sort of manage infrastructure because they have to, okay? Infrastructure ops traditionally manage infrastructure for the sake of infrastructure. And while they're supposed to work together, there's often some natural tension there, right? Because developers never release bad code. It never causes problems on the, internet, on, the, on the network. Infrastructure ops are like, no way you're putting your app on my network, because I know it's going to bring the whole thing down, okay? And that's where the DevOps movement has tried to get those two together so that there's less impact on the network. And then who would be what I would consider a cloud infrastructure manager? Cloud infrastructure being either very large or very dynamic. You're doing cloud bursting. You're doing cloud arbitrage, public, private, hybrid. Anybody doing kind of cloud infrastructure management? Okay, so we're, okay, so a few. That's pretty close to, that's pretty close to what we're seeing is, is that as, as, as organizations are, are maturing, even the smaller organizations are doing more what we call cloudy or cloud infrastructure management. And those includes, that includes monitoring and proactively reacting to things and monitoring for monitoring for things like performance and monitoring for things like service or memory leaks and then doing stuff before those things go sideways. Um, okay, let's start with who's got, anybody have over 50,000 nodes under management total? Anybody? Okay, anybody have over 20,000 nodes? So couple, anybody over 10,000 nodes? Okay, so between 10 and 20, okay. And then 5,000 nodes, five to 10,000, okay and 2,500 to 5,000, okay, 1,000 uh, to 2,500, okay, and then hands up if you're 500 or below, okay, so the bulk of them are fairly, what we consider fairly small infrastructures. Um, anybody have more than 20% of your boxes windows? Okay, 50% um, windows? Okay, one, on, one over 50. Okay, so are you guys primary, anybody have, anybody have much Unix, or is it mostly Linux? Unix, what kind of Unix? If you're embarrassed to say, we can talk about it later. Okay. Remember, I was a Sun guy, I'm a Solaris guy, old, old, old Solaris guy. What kind of Unix? You'd like to be able to manage them. After you do, you won't want to be able to manage them anymore. No. Actually, I really, I, yeah. You'd like us to be able to manage them easily via state so you don't have to touch them. That's what you want. I get that. Okay, so of the Linux variants, um, gosh, this is gonna be hard. Ubuntu Linux primarily, okay. CentOS, a lot of CentOS. Arch, I only say that because Tom loves Arch. I rarely see it in the wild, but our dev team freaking loves it. I think it's because Tom loves it and some other people have adopted it. What other Linuxes are we seeing a lot? Red Hat, Rel? Rel, what else? Sluz. Sluz, okay. Container, who's using containers in their environment? Containers, uh, what container technology are you using? Docker, Docker. Anybody using anything but Docker? Linux containers. Linux containers. Uh, interesting side note, I was actually in Finland when the first kernel of, of uh, Linux was released. I was at the university. Uh, where Linus was, I speak Finnish, although poorly. Um, that always buys me a half a cred of, of geek cred with you guys. Okay, so you guys use mostly using Docker for application deployment. Okay, who's OpenStack? Anybody got OpenStack? You guys using OpenStack? Okay, who's current Salt users today? So okay, the majority. Okay, any other questions you guys can think to ask? This helps us, and it helps me because it helps me understand where to prioritize stuff. Okay, the last question before we go, and you can move on, just so they have something else to look at besides me. Keep going. Yeah, we already did that. Keep going. Okay, last question before we get to it. Why a graphical interface? I need to know why you guys are interested. I know what my other customers have told me. I know why I would be interested in it. Is anybody 
Is it, is it, is it primarily for yourself? Go ahead. The answer to there was he has too much data to aggregate and he'd like to be able to run jobs across all the masters in test or simulation mode, we'll talk about that in a second, test equals true, to show you things that would change. That's very common. It's data aggregation and visibility. Who else? Why the GUI? Okay, reports, right? Okay, that's the second, probably the, it's one or two. It's, it's I have so much data and I can't gather it at the command line. Or it's this, it's historical tracking. What has happened, when and why? That's probably, by the way, that's maybe the most common request, is they say, we've got all this stuff happening. And as teams grow, and I hate to say this, and again, this is kind of off the record. As teams grow, people like me get hired. Total idiots. I mean, I was, a, I mean, yeah, I know how to do this. I'm going to totally run this script. Why is the network down? I'm not sure. Let's go look at the script. That happens. You need to know who and why and what happened, okay? So that's, a, that's an important one. It's probably mainly the one, that's actually one of the features when you say, you know, I tell a developer, really all I need out of the GUI is I need to be able to track what happened when, and they're like, that's not sexy at all. We got to do this other cool thing, okay? Why GUI? What's important to you? Ah, okay, he's a user to tie the GUI into their SSL authorization. That's good, security, uh, roll and scope based security, we'll talk about that in a second. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. He wants to uh, not be up at 3 o'clock in the morning. He wants to enable or empower other users to be able to make changes. Um, that's actually an interesting concept. How many of you plan to con give control of your infrastructure to people outside of your group? Anybody interested in that? Okay. We're going to talk about that in a second. For me, as an ex-admin, one of the most important things that I did, or one of the, one of the best things I did, was containerize... Not, not container, but basically segment off small clusters and hand control over to the requester so that I didn't have to deal with their constant, hey, can you make this change? Hey, can you install this app? Can you do this? Can you do that? That does a couple things. It gets them out of your hair, if you have any, and if you don't, you can grow a giant beard. The second reason is it helps illustrate the value of your group. Who fights to, who fights to explain to management why IT is valuable? Do any of you guys have that battle? Nobody does that. That's great. People are coming around. One of the constant battles most IT, well, most IT organizations fight is illustrating value. People view IT or infrastructure, they view them as a cost center. God, we spend so much money on IT. It's not us. It's those jackasses in marketing. We, we didn't decide to throw up a whole web server. We'd be out golfing or drinking beer or playing Ultima Online. But you guys are asking us to do all this stuff. We're not, IT is not the cost center. It's marketing, it's sales, it's customer support, it's the people asking for the resources. And if you can illustrate where that spend is going, that's tremendously important. It's one of the things which most people don't ask us for, but when they see it is important. We'll talk about it in a second. Someone else, who else? Why else is the GUI important? Have we covered them all? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Okay, they're using Rundeck uh, for integration with different solutions. Salt Google will give you that. We'll be there in about two minutes. We're getting close. Go ahead. We have to build anticipation. Go ahead. Please.
Yes, my boss doesn't want, I hear that a lot. You could pretty much stop at my boss. <laughs> that kind of answers that. You don't want to, you don't, the bosses don't want to learn command line. And ultimately, it's kind of hard to see what's going on in command line. Um, you know, you can show, you can show a script to a non-technical person a hundred times. You can walk them through it. When they execute it, that guy's still going, I'm not really sure exactly what happened. Okay, all good reasons. Um, go ahead, Shotab. If you want, let's switch over. So with that, let's go ahead and switch over. And while Shotab is switching over to the demo, let me give you a little bit of background. The first release of the Salt Stack GUI is, is built along what we call the minimum viable product model. We had a choice. We released the basic framework, and Mark used the analogy, the open source project. And let's talk about that for a second. What's the difference between open source and, and enterprise? In a nutshell, it's the GUI, okay? We provide the community a series of tools. If you'd like to wire those tools together, and you can, you can put a database in, you can put reports, you can hook a reporting engine to it, you can do all this stuff. You can come into our store and take all the car parts you want, wire them together, and go down the road. If you want to carry your family or your business or your job in a car you built yourself and you know, off-the-shelf parts, that's a, that's a great answer. If, however, you'd like a pre-built car that's tested and we've made sure the airbags are deployed and, frankly, you don't want to spend the time assembling the car, you've got better things to do, then you're going to pick up the GUI and you're going to be a Salt Stack Enterprise user. Um, that's sort of the cut line. If you want to have any finer grain discussions about it, then we can talk about that. But basically, the cut line is the graphical interface. Second, the graphical interface, and we're going to talk today a little bit about what's today, what's in the first release. We're going to iterate this pretty fast. And it's been architected to be very flexible and grow uh, over time as we add functionality. So this is the Salt Stack Enterprise. Is there any way to zoom that up a little bit? There we go. That helps. Actually, that didn't work, because now I can't see the view switcher at the bottom. So let me give you a brief tour. On the top left, do we have a laser pointer here anywhere? We should, probably should have thought of that. Is this a laser pointer? You don't? Somebody's car alarm just went off. OK. Basically, as we talk to people and we talk to users as we go through them, there's two ways people start jobs. The first way is the most common way. They know the assets or the resources they're going to manage. OK, I'm in charge of a web store. I'm in charge of a QA environment. And I know the job that I need to do. That's this view on here. This thing right here is called the resource navigator. Oh, hey, look, laser pointer. Good job, thanks. I appreciate that. Normally, I have one of those, but oh, it's a green one even. Great. If anybody from the TSA shows up, alert me, because I'm going to run. I've had some run-ins with the TSA. I shoot competitively. And one time, my wife and I were taking a trip, and I loaned her my bag. She forgot to take. Normally, when I go on a trip, I empty my entire bag out and like reload what I need. She didn't do that. So we're in line, and they're like, is this your bag? Yeah, it's my bag. Do you have batteries in there? No, there's no batteries. Search and search and search, and they pull out an extended magazine full of bucket mouth hollow point 45s. <laughs> I met every TSA guy in the airport that day, and for four years I was randomly selected for a extra screening. So the TSA, TSA and I have a long and distinguished history. <laughs> uh, we're, we're tight. Right here is the view switcher. This thing is called the resource navigator. And there's two things you can do here. You can start with the resource. These are the resources. This is a resource view or resource pool. These are physical views. So this is all the minions. This is quick target we'll talk about in a second. Now, in the next release, as we move forward, you'll see additional resource views show up here. So example, if you have AWS integration, you'll see all the AWS. If you click on AWS, all the AWS machines will load in what we call the resource manager. So the context flows left to right. Anything you select here will display in the resource manager. And in the resource manager, when you select or subselect from that group, you're going to see details over in the details pane. So, Tom, if you can get one of the details to load at any point, just go ahead and do that. We're still working on this. We're a couple weeks from finishing code complete, so there's some stuff that's going to turn on and off. You'll notice over here in the details pane, I've got different views. So I can see the job status. Um, I can see actual minion stats or details. I'm going to show you a report view in a few seconds that's got actual graphs and charts. The graphs and charts can be added to this palette on the right. So this is user customizable. You can actually decide what shows up on this right in the details pane, and it's what's important to you. The goal for this particular UI is to be able to manage your entire infrastructure from this single pane of glass. You do not need to be flipping around, OK? The second way people do things is they start with the job. So we go ahead and click on the Jobs tab, and that's going to load the Jobs browser down the left. These are all your states and jobs. 
that you run against your system. A good example of this would be something like the shell shock vulnerability. I don't know the assets that I need to target yet, but I do know that I need to put this state file out. I know that the shell shock vulnerability has been published. I'm going to go ahead and run this, but I need to find the assets that I'm targeting. Those are the two ways people start jobs. Can anybody think of any other ways we start jobs? Yeah, that's what I thought. I couldn't think of it. I had one customer one time raise his hand. He's like, yeah, we start jobs sometimes when my boss reads about it in Info Week, and then he tells us to do that. And OK, that's fair, but that's a starting with a job going to an asset. So tablets. Oh, the other two here are reports view, which it's hard to see on this projector. We might be able to do, should we dim the lights in here? This is a dev group, right? We should probably have the lights off. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, the, off the record, can we stop the recording for a second? No. OK. We actually are going to add themes here. We started out with a dark theme that was, that was uh, it's monochrome here and there. Someone in the company who shall remain nameless, the CEO, Mark Chen, he didn't like it because it's very dark. And we showed the first mock-ups to our customers, and they were kind of like this. They were white and bright. Out of the about dozen I showed, seven of them were like, you know, that's going to burn my retinas out, right? Like, I live in a cave. I don't even go outside. And so we moved to a darker theme, but Mark was like, ah, it's pretty dark. It makes me feel depressed and like I want to kill myself. So we switched over to a colored theme. We will be shipping with some theme switchers, so you can choose the theme that makes the most sense for your work environment. And if you're like every other developer I know, it's probably dark. You probably have socks and sandals on, hopefully a beard, and some cool music running in the background. That's how most of you guys work. That's how I work. OK, so with top, let's go back to cloud. So let's start a basic workflow. The idea here is, is that you'll pick a resource. You'll start here, and you'll go to all minions. We have a filter bar. The filter bar actually gives you the ability to search across all your minions. And again, if I pick a subset, let's say I pick the AWS target, it will show all my AWS machines. Or if I show my DigitalOcean, or if I pick a logical target group down here, I can always filter against that. So Shotab, go ahead and let's do a filter. The filter allows you to sub-select and filter against things like text, the node name, IP address, target group, whatever, or against grain data. In this particular build, it's broken, but this filter will actually be compound. Right now, we have to do text or grain. By the time we ship, in maybe about a month, these will be compounding. So you can go in and say, show me all the hosts, which start with QA, which are of the operating system, Ubuntu, kernel, whatever. Okay? This is how machines are located in your system. The filters can actually be saved. So you can go ahead and just generate a filter, create a group, whatever you want to call it. The filters can actually be saved. The filters are user specific. So the filters that you build will be saved in your particular console, and they'll always be available. So you can go in and click and say, give me all my windows, you know, whatever. Go ahead. The filters will be shareable, OK? Using security, we'll talk about security in a second. He's going to go ahead and give it a filter name. We will be able to share it. If you have the correct rights, you can publish those or make those available. As he creates a filter and starts to subselect, he's going to get a return in what we call the resource manager. The context is set on the left, and then the things that the context selects that you're managing will always show up in the center. Okay? And then he'll go ahead and give it a name. And you'll notice that I've got two folders here, public and private. These are logical, what we call target groups. These are the groups that are assembled via your search filter. And these are the groups that you'll manage. These are the minions that you'll do things to. Okay? He's going to go ahead and create a folder. Public, public targets show up for everybody. Private targets only show up for yourself. Those will be controlled by rights. Only, only users with the correct rights will be able to publish public targets. And some people may not have rights. They may be able to, able to only create private targets. And some people may not be able to create target groups at all. They'll just use them. Okay. So did you get a target group created? Okay. The other thing, now I'm going to go off the, I'm going to do what I normally won't let anybody do. But since you guys have spent the time and money to come here, we're going to go into the roadmap a little bit. Again, because this is a minimum viable product to use, there's some things that we're not done with. We're close, but we're going to ship, we're going to iterate pretty quick. You're going to see pretty rapid updates to this over the next few months. Probably about every month we're going to have a drop. I talked earlier about flexibility. Today, we have what we call target groups. In the next release or two, we are going to convert these from groups to environments. I hate the word cloud. What does cloud mean? It's like DevOps. It's so ambiguous and so broad, it's meaningless unless you know what you're talking about. What is a cloud? A cloud is a solution. That's all it is. A cloud is a cluster of machines that do something. It's a web store so customers can buy product from you. It's file storage so people can store files. It's, 
you know, it's an application thing. It's a, it's a, it's a website for marketing, so the VP of marketing will get off your back because he has somewhere to host his slides. Whatever that is, a cloud is just a solution. Okay, Shwetab, this is gonna be hard. Can we shrink it down so we can see the view switcher at the bottom? Because the view switcher is important to the flexibility of this. Oh boy. Keep trying, it's coming, it's close, it's right there. I don't wanna do the imagine if you will bit. Okay, we're gonna redneck this. Hold on, Shwetab, I have a temporary solution here. Oh, there we go, okay. For the next few minutes, we'll talk about this. When you select a context or a cloud or a group, and we'll come back to this in a second. We have this thing on the bottom which allows you to switch the views of what you're looking at. Right now we're looking at the list view. Shwetab, go ahead and click on the icon view. Just, it's not done yet, but you'll get to understand what we're talking about. The icon view will be, this is a heat map view. We're actually gonna use fonts here. Uh, obviously it's not quite done. This isn't the actual icon we're gonna use, but um, the marketing guy was like, that looks great. I'm like, no, it's just a placeholder. Um, these will be um, an icon view, and what this means is you'll be able to display several thousand, um, probably up to around 40,000 minions in this single page, okay? The view switcher allows you to look at these differently. Go ahead and click on like the, the dashboard view. The dashboard view gives you a graphical view of the same exact context. So what this means is I can select all my minions or any subset and then see that in different ways, okay? There's two things on the roadmap, and when I say, usually when a product manager read, says roadmap, he means in the distant future, I will not commit to a date, and it could be two days or two years. What I mean is sometime in the next quarter, it's coming very, very quickly. The first I wanna talk about is the target groups. This mechanism right here, these are, these are static or logical targets. We are going to do a thing called dynamic targets, okay? There's three kinds of dynamic targets that you're gonna see, two main ones and a, and a, and a minor one. The first kind of dynamic target is targets that are built automatically based on salt. They'll be built based on grain data. So what does that mean? You're gonna see a target group down here that says all my Linux machines. And under that you'll see all your Linux by OS, all your Ubuntu, all your CentOS, all your you know, Arch. Um, you'll see all your Windows machines. You may see all the machines that are running Apache. You may see all the machines that are under, that only have one free memory slot. You may see all the machines that are over 80% processor for the last week or whatever. These groups will, will update automatically based on grain data. There'll be filters that are pre-written into the system and will constantly be updated as your infrastructure changes. So what does that mean? Someone says, oh, hey, we gotta update all the Ubuntu you know, 14.4 machines. You'll be able to come down and click the target group that says here's all my Ubuntu 14.4 across my entire enterprise. You'll be able to click the filter button at the top, give me a subset of it, say I just wanna do the QA ones for now, do QA ones, deploy a job right there take you 10 seconds. The groups will be built, the filters will be written. That's the first kind of dynamic groups. The second kind of, and again, put your imagination hats on, imagine if you will. The second type of dynamic group, I think is the more compelling one. SaltStack will be publishing dynamic groups or filters. What does that mean? When the shell shock vulnerability was, was released, people, we heard about it in the keynote today, they were actually notified a couple days before the release was actually publicized. They went in and they wrote a state file, they wrote a targeting filter, and they deployed a fix. SaltStack will be publishing things like that. A good example of that is a vulnerability. So you'll come in and log in your console, and there will be a folder that says vulnerabilities. One of the vulnerabilities may be Shellshock. It'll have a little indicator on it. It'll say, you'll click on the vulnerability, and again, using the view switcher, there's a, a detail view of that, and it will have a description. Shellshock vulnerability, it affects the bash terminal, Here's all the machines that you're vulnerable. It'll already have scanned, the filter will already be written, and it will have a state file or job included with it. You'll be able to go look at the job or the state and say this is how it's fixed, make any changes you want to if any are necessary, and then deploy the job right away, okay? That's tremendously valuable because it avoids you A, having to know about it, B, it avoids you having to write the filters, it avoids you having to search for it, and it avoids you having to write the state file. Other types of jobs, how to build an OpenStack infrastructure, how to build a Docker container infrastructure, how to build a hybrid cloud, how to do cloud arbitrage. We have a guy, we have a guy, there's a lot of guys in this room. There's more collective salt brain power in this room than you probably realize. Um, the team we have built is phenomenal. Um, I'm impressed every single day with the intelligence of our, of our shocked really kind of at the intelligence of our, of our engineers. But we have a guy in the room who is doing cloud arbitrage for one of our customers. Cloud arbitrage, selects when they need to spin up. Cloud Arbitrage selects the cheapest 
public cloud infrastructure to spin the job up on. So you may have, an infrastructure, you may have a, a dynamic group that shows you how to set up cloud arbitrage, how to pick the cheapest as you do cloud bursting, those kinds of things. The last kind of dynamic group is kind of interesting. When you run a job against 1,000 machines, you may have some subset of those that fail, for example. We'll automatically build a dynamic group based on those failures. So for example, if you run, if you run, a, you know, if you run a Debian upgrade on 1,000 machines and 25 of them fail, we'll build a subset. You'll go look at the job and see a subset target group of those that you can publish or go do something else to. Those are dynamic groups. The view switcher will also be extended. As we create more and more public groups, we're gonna create additional views here. So for example, we'll have a view here which shows all your network devices. You may have, I don't know if you guys heard, but we've been doing some work with IBM for their software to find virtual networking. We can control, we can control network attached storage. We can control the network devices. We can control the containers. We'll add additional views down here to see those things, including settings. We'll have a settings view for each of these individual, each of these individual clouds. As, the, as, as open source technology like Beacons is a good example. Beacons is a reactor for the Minion, okay? What does that give us? It gives us the ability to monitor the Minion at the Minion level and react to events. What does that mean? It means that I can actually set a state for this particular cloud. So anything that comes in this particular target group will run this state file. The Minion can monitor compliance for that state itself. If the Minion falls out of compliance, it can inject an event onto the bus and the master can either remediate by running the state again, or if it fails, it can pull that minion out of the pool and replace it with a new minion. What does that mean for you guys? It means this auto healing dynamic infrastructure. It means you don't get that call at two o'clock in the morning, and I've got those calls. People will call you, it's, you know, it's one o'clock on a Saturday morning, and they're like, hey man, the web store's down. Sorry about your weekend, let me know how it goes, click. And you're sitting there all night or all day trying to figure that out. Salt will manage that for you. That, so, the, so the groups, dynamic grouping and the views will allow us to grow this console over time. And then we've got some other stuff here called, um, we've got this other stuff that's grouped by, it allows you to group by key state, it allows you to group by connection status, job status, that kind of thing. So it allows you to very fine grain control over how you see and manage your infrastructure. So Shwetab, let's go ahead and grab one of the target groups and then let's show them the quick action buttons and show them how they deploy jobs. So once you create a target group, you then come up here and you pick the jobs action button. We've got two things here, and I want to talk about current feature, and I want to talk about future. One of the things you'll notice right here is we have what's called Quick Run. Quick Run is sort of the terminal equivalent for this release. When you click Quick Run, you're going to get a box. You can actually type your terminal command in there, okay? The other option you have is to go ahead and, and I actually think terminal run, I actually think Quick Run's broken in the last build. The other thing is, is you can pick any of the jobs. So go ahead and pick one of the jobs for Tob, and you're going to launch into a scheduler. At this point, we kind of go into traditional job scheduling. We have some options here. We have a time and crap. I don't know if the projector's blurry or if I'm just old. But we've got a couple of options. We can run it now. We can run it in the future. We can do some retry options. So just run once or keep retrying until it succeeds. Um, we can end after traditional scheduling. One of the things we're introducing is minion blackout periods. So you'd be able to set a blackout on a minion. We have several customers who have minions that are on mission critical servers who can't take jobs at certain times. And one of the things that we commonly get asked for is, is can I set a blackout period on a minion so if anybody tries to run a job on that minion, it will reject it? And we'll reject, we'll, we'll reject that one of two ways. We'll either just pass the job off to null it will never happen, or we'll queue the job and run the job as soon as the period lifts. Of course, we'll give you the ability to override that if it's a, you know, if it's a mission critical you, and you have the correct rights, you can override that. The other thing we have here is the ability to simulate or test equals true, okay? Test equals true gives you the ability to simulate the job and show what would happen. One of the things we're gonna introduce as we move forward is, is we'll probably turn, we'll probably do test equals true on every job by default. So if you say run it now, the system will run test equals true before it ever runs the job and it will come back and say, hey, we're predicting an 80% failure rate on this. Go look at your, go look at your state file, it'll avoid kind of reiterating through trying to push out jobs that maybe are not correctly formed or don't do what you anticipate they do. That's one of the things we'll turn on. I have a question for you. This is a roadmap item. I had a feature, I have a feature planned which replaces this quick run concept. And I thought it was kind of a gimmick. I thought it was my version of spinning weasel. As we've demoed to people this week, I've been surprised at the passion people have for this idea. 
One of the things that's endemic to SaltStack and the SaltStack DNA is the command line. We're never taking the command line away. This system is built to read anything that happens in your infrastructure. If you drop into command line and do something, it's gonna be reflected here, okay? So you can't get around this by doing stuff at the command line. But one of the concepts we're toying with is these, these panels on the left and right are designed to be hidden. We actually have controls which will tuck them away, which means you can pick your context, load everything in your resource window, and then manage everything out of that central window. But one of the concepts we're toying with is something like a keystroke command, which will drop the GUI away and flip you into basically a terminal emulator, so a black command line, you know, a command line looking screen that will allow you to type command line controls, hit enter, and run that job against that, that target context, and then keystroke and flip back into the GUI again, just kind of flipping back and forth between the command line or not. Who's interested in a feature like that? Okay, so at least half of you is that, if that's a high priority, so a, a priority one, keep your hand up. Okay, so four of you, priority two, it's kind of interesting. And priority three, it's a gimmick. It's kind of cool, but you're not gonna make a buying decision on it. Yeah, that kind of surprised me because I kind of thought it was a gimmicky thing. As we talked to customers, they said, actually, that'll help us convert to the GUI because I may not know how to do it in the graphical interface, so I can flip to the command line and then do that and flip back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the feedback is basically exactly what some of the other guys have said is it's it's easier. I know how to do it in the command line already. Doing this and trying to train other people how to do it is kind of hard. So if I can flip to the command line and do it and let, let them migrate to the new functionality over time is a is a win. And I, I completely agree. Go ahead. Right. The, the question is, is how does this console connect to the masters? Because if it flips the command line, it's going to connect to the master. In effect, and Daniel and... Yeah. The web GUI is an overlay over top of your existing master infrastructure. When you install the web GUI, you actually take your existing masters, add the masters into the GUI, and it will suck all the minions in and give them to you there. So in effect, and I know that this is architecturally isn't completely accurate, but it'll help you understand. In effect, the web GUI sort of turns the masters into functionally syndics. So when you run a command at the web GUI, it publishes that to each master that has a minion that's in the target group. So if you have a target group that has minions across multiple masters, it just packages that command and runs that command on each master in, that has a minion that is in that group. Does that make sense? Not, not technically a syndic. It just puts them out to the masters, and then the masters communicate to their attached minions. Yeah, over Salt API. That's a, yeah, so, sorry, it's, I was going with the product management answer. Salt API, sorry. <laughs> That's the head injury talk. Go ahead. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh. So, uh, like yeah. Okay. Okay. So the question is: Is can this link to documentation? We've, we're, we're running out low on time. So Shwetab, I'm going to have you do one thing. Go ahead and either cancel or run this job. One other thing I want you guys to see is: Is we actually are adding new documentation. Jacob Hammond's our documentation writer. He was in the room. I don't know if he still is. He's got a session actually going right now. The documentation is actually being changed. We're actually adding user documentation, which is based around enterprise use cases. We still will have our technical documentation, which is sort of documenting the open source project and how to wire this up, but we're actually adding context sensitive right within the console itself, so you can click on this and this will actually show use cases of documentation. One last thing, um, so top, go ahead and back, flip back and let's go back over to the jobs folder. Let me show you something really quickly. The jobs folder, 
in a nutshell, works the same way. You basically click on a job, you'll see the job details here. We'll be adding the ability to edit those jobs or files, state files, and we will have different view switches. So one of the views of these will be historical views. Any resource in this, any resource in the console, so the, so the, the jobs themselves or the target groups, anything that happens on any of these resources is collected in a historical view. And one of those views in the view switcher will be historical view. So anytime a job is run, either through the GUI or at the command line, if you go run a command line job, the GUI will pick that up from the masters and will capture that historically. So you can go in and actually view history of anything that happens. We're capturing history on three main objects, users, resources, and jobs. So you'll be able to go in and look at a resource, see what's happened on that resource historically, report against it. You can go look at a job, see where that job is run, what resources it hit on, along with graphs that show success, or users. You can go look at a user and say, what has this user run or done or, or tracked along with, along with those. So one more question, and then we're out of time. Go ahead. Good question. Yes, we are giving, the question is, can we limit users to target groups and states? Yes, we'll be limiting users. You can control access using LDAP, AD, whatever you want, to the groups. So if, you, if I only have access to the test group, I will only see the test target group. And we'll also be at limiting access to modules. So I may, have, I may have the ability to run some modules, but not others. So we'll be able to control all that through own scope based security. Let me hold here. We had one more question here. OK, last question. Uh huh. Yeah, the, the question is, is, can my users see some stuff but modify only a subset? That's true. We will have standard .nix access, so you'll have read only or execute. So we've run out of time. I appreciate your time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. Or I'll go outside. If there's more questions, I want you to come talk to me. Um, we'll be making this available. We'll be running a beta for this sometime in the next three weeks. We run a fairly tight beta. I usually do 10 customers or less with high feedback. If you're interested, come talk to me. And thanks for your time today. Thank you.